This chapter, chapter 20, deals with the lymphatic system. This is associated with the cardiovascular system and deals with transport. It's also part of the immune system for protection. Uh, one of the things you may end up dealing with in your career is uh, monitoring lymph nodes. And that's going to be a clue as to your patient's health if the lymph nodes are swollen. That's often a sign of infection. So what does the lymphatic system do? It's going to help return fluid to the blood. If you remember the cardiovascular system in the capillary bed, as the blood flows into the capillary bed, you have a lot of fluid that leaks out of the capillary. It has to, to supply the cells with oxygen and nutrients. So that fluid leaks out into the interstitial space. Uh, that interstitial fluid carries it to the cells. They uptake the oxygen and the, the nutrients. And then the waste products from all the metabolic activities and things like carbon dioxide, which is a waste product, which is in that interstitial fluid flows back into the blood. However, the amount that flows back into the blood is less than the amount that leaked out of the blood. So that means you have increased interstitial fluid. You have to get that fluid back into the blood because you're always trying to maintain a constant volume of blood. Well, if you have stuff leaking out, you've got to get it back in. Otherwise, the volume would just continue decreasing, decreasing, decreasing in the blood, and the interstitial fluid would be increasing, and you'd have some major swelling issues. So you have to get that fluid that leaked out back into the blood. How are you going to do that? It's by the lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system is going to be... Uh, comprised of three parts. It's got your vessels. It's got the lymph, which is actually the fluid. And then you have what are known as the lymph nodes. These are going to play a huge role, essentially in helping to filter out that lymph, which is the fluid, filter it before you put it back in the blood, clean it up some. The lymphoid organs and tissues help to support the immune system. How do they do this? They um, tend to house or comprise within them are a lot of the, your phagocytic cells that will engulf and carry out phagocytosis, which is basically chew it up, eat it up, of anything foreign. And then it's also going to uh, house your lymphocytes. If you remember, lymphocytes are one of the five types of leukocytes, white blood cells, that are involved with the immune system. So where are these uh, lymphoid organs and tissues? What are they? Uh, they're scattered throughout the body. They include the spleen, the thymus, the tonsils, your lymph nodes, and there are some additional lymphoid tissues. So as I mentioned, that lymphatic system is going to return that interstitial fluid uh, back into the blood. It's going to circulate about three liters of fluid per day. Now, when it's between the cells in that interstitial space, you call it interstitial fluid. Once it's in the lymphatic vessel, you call it lymph. The lymphatic vessels, they are essentially a one-way uh, street. They're a one-way uh, pathway. The only way the lymph is going to flow is towards the heart. It does contain, uh, the vessels contain capillaries, so they start off small, they get increasingly larger, similar to the way the veins are um, as it approaches to the heart. So the lymphatic uh, capillaries, they're what we call blind-ended. They're going to weave throughout the tissues. They're often very uh, close. They're embedded within the capillary bed itself. Uh, they are not present in bones. They are not present in the teeth, in the bone marrow, or in the central nervous system. The central nervous system, instead of lymph, is going to use your cerebral spinal fluid for draining. Instead, they're going to be very similar to the uh, blood capillaries. However, they're more permeable, so it's easier to uptake larger molecules, uh, easier to take up particles that would not easily flow back into the blood.
Now, from a positive standpoint, it's good they can take up these proteins that may have leaked out. The disadvantage is because they're feeding things like to the circulatory system into the blood, they can be a pathway for cancer cells that maybe have broken off of the tumor to move. It may be a pathway for pathogens, uh, those microorganisms that can cause diseases to be able to move through the body. Once they get in the lymph, um, they can then pass through the lymphatic system. Hopefully they'll be filtered out at the lymph nodes if they are able to pass through those. You do not want them to get in the blood because once they're in the blood, it becomes systemic. It can go anywhere in the body then. So that's the In this diagram, uh, it is showing uh, the relationship between the lymphatic system and the circulatory system. As you can see, um, we turn our pointer on here. As you can see, here is your capillary bed. The green are the uh, lymphatic capillaries. See how they're intertwined and intermeshed in within that, that blood capillary bed so that they can more effectively pick up this excess fluid. And you see it's one way. It's going to flow this way. So you have the smaller vessels. They're going to all kind of merge together. And in this diagram, you can see here, through this capillary bed, they merge into the larger lymphatic vessels, and then they're going to pass through uh, the lymph nodes. This, these little swellings here are showing that the lymphatic vessels do have valves, similar to the valves that you have in the veins, to keep the fluid flowing in one direction. And then when they pass, you have multiple lymphatic vessels flowing in to a lymph node, and then fewer flowing out of it. We'll discuss why in a moment. And then they may pass through several lymph nodes before eventually it is going to flow back into the circulation system. Now, within the lymphatic capillaries, there are some overlapping cells to form kind of a little mini valves. They're anchored in place. Um, so, as the extracellular fluid, that interstitial fluid increases, it's going to open those valves even more. As the uh, interstitial fluid decreases, then the mini valves are going to close. So they are able to respond to the amount of fluid that's there in that interstitial fluid. Lacteals are specialized lymph, uh, capillaries that are in the intestinal mucosa that absorb digestive fat and they're going to help deliver um, this fatty lumps into the blood. So this diagram here is showing how you've got essentially like these little flaps. These are the mini valves we're talking about. So as you have excess fluid, it's going to open that, allowing more of it to flow in. And they're anchored in place by these filaments. Your larger lymphatic vessels, um, are what the capillaries will drain into. And they are going to be, as I said, similar to veins and some of their, their structures. They have thin walls, they have more internal valves. Um, so they're, they're collecting um, from the capillaries. They tend to travel with the superficial veins. Um, the deeper vessels tend to travel next to the arteries. Lymphatic trunks, this is where you have several of the collecting vessels draining, um, emerging together, if you will, and they tend to be named for the area of the body that they are draining. So you have the lumbar, you have uh, like the subclavian, the jugular trunks, etc. From the trunks, the lymph is going to be uh, flowing from there into one of two very large lymphatic ducts. There's the right lymphatic duct and the thoracic duct. The right lymphatic duct drains the right upper arm, the right side of the head, and the thorax area. The thoracic duct will drain the rest of the body. In 
A lot of individuals, it starts out as, it looks like an enlarged sac that's called the cistern chili. Um, both of those steps will drain the lymph into uh, the vein, into the venous circulation, right around the junction of the internal jugular and the subclavian veins. Excuse me. And so you can see here the green would be uh, right here is a thoracic duct coming up. You have over here then on the right side, um, and, and right here is that cistern coli that swelling that I, I mentioned. And it's moving up here. And then on the right side, you have the right lymphatic duct that comes in right here. And over here is where, on the left side, it will drain into, like we said, on the subclavian veins. So right here is the right, and right here is the left, where that lump is returned into the, um, the blood. This is showing the breakdown in terms of which duct is draining which part of the body. As we said, the right lymphatic duct is draining from the right limb, the right thoracic area and the right part of the, the head and neck area it drains right here. And then on the thoracic duct, it's draining basically the rest of the body, both the limbs, the pelvic abdominal area, the left thoracic area, the left arm, and the left side of the head and the neck. And it's all going to drain right here. You can also see on that previous picture the location of a lot of the lymph nodes. Sometimes there's a condition, uh, lymphagitis, where the lymphatic vessels, they look like red lines under the skin. It's inflammation. Anything uh, that ends with ITIS means inflammation. So this would be inflammation of those lymphatic vessels. <coughs> the lymph system is a low-pressure system, similar to uh, what we see in the veins. And so how are you going to move that lump along? It's very similar to what you see with the veins. There's the skeletal muscles providing kind of that milking action as they contract. They help to push it along. The pressure changes that occur during uh, respiration that occur in the thorax area are going to help move it. As I mentioned before, you have valves that help to prevent backflow from occurring. Actually, the arteries, because they often are lying right next to the arteries, the so pulsating of the arteries often helps to, to move also the lymph along through the lymphatic vessels. Um, physical activity is going to help increase the flow of the lymph. Um, oftentimes, when an area is needs to heal, immobilization of the area kind of keeps... Um, some of the inflammatory area components of chemicals in that area for faster healing. So they're the lymphedema is severe localized edema. Uh, swelling is caused because something is preventing the normal return of lymph to the blood. And so that lymph is remaining in an area and you get that swelling. Why does this happen? Uh, what's preventing the lump from returning? It may be due to tumors. It may be due to removal of some of the lymph nodes and the lymphatic vessels. Or lymphatics are the lymph vessels. Uh, oftentimes in cancer, depending on where the cancer is located and whether it has started to uh, spread or not, you may want to remove some of the, the lymphatics and lymph nodes especially if cancer has already reached them, you want to possibly remove them to prevent further spread. Well, if you remove them, uh, it takes a while for the body to be able to compensate and deal with this excess fluid. The way you used to get rid of it, you, you removed those vessels. And so um, you're going to have to adjust to that. As I said, compensate compensate for it, but immediately right afterwards, you may have severe. Uh, lymphoid cells are going to be composed of one of two types, either immune system cells or supporting cells. 
The immune system cells, these are the lymphocytes. Uh, they are part of what we call the adaptive immune system, and they can be subdivided into one of two types, either the T lymphocytes or the B lymphocytes. And we tend to abbreviate them and just call T cells or B cells. The T cells and B cells are both going to help protect against any foreign substance that we refer to as antigens. So we're talking about things such as bacteria, viruses, cancer cells. And that's a good thing. That's what's helping as a protective or defense mechanism. Um, they will also detect any four things, sometimes things that aren't necessarily harm to, such as pollen, plant pollen, plant dander, or animal dander, things like that. Now, the T cells are going to help uh, kind of regulate the immune response. Some of them are going to be involved with attacking and destroying infected cells. B cells are going to be involved with what we call uh, the humoral immune response, which is going to be producing plasma cells, which in turn produce antibodies against those antigens, against those foreign substances. That's going to help mark them, essentially putting a red flag or a bright neon light on saying, hey, this is not supposed to be here. Come destroy it. <coughs> there are going to be other uh, lymphoid immune cells, uh, macrophages and dendritic cells that are also going to be uh, helping with the whole immune response. They help to activate the T cells, but the T cells and B cells need to be activated and so the dendritic cells and macrophages will activate the T cells and when we get into the immune response we'll look at detail as to then how the T cells will activate the B cells etc. Your supporting lymphoid cells uh, there's several of these the reticular cells these help to produce different fibers they're called stroma in the organs uh, and what the stroma does it's essentially like setting up a scaffolding to help support the immune cells. Hang out and attach to. So in this picture, you can see all of those strands. That's the um, reticular fibers or the, the stroma. That's that scaffolding. And then that way the lymphocytes, which look like the round balls, they can attach to that scaffolding. They can hang out there, and as anything is passing through that sinus, that's where uh, the lymph is going to be moving through, it can uh, basically be on surveillance and check out and see anything passing through. This is okay. Oh, that's not. Now we need to start the process of attacking it. So what is the function of the lymphoid tissue? It's going to help uh, provide a place to store or house those lymphocytes and allow a place for them to uh, multiply. And as I said, they act as surveillance. Um, as the lymph is moving through, it's acting as a filter for it. <coughs> Diffuse lymphoid tissue, this is a loose arrangement of these lymphoid cells, and some of the fibers are found pretty much throughout uh, the entire body. Maybe higher concentrations of certain membranes. Lymphoid follicles or nodules, these are areas of uh, very tightly compacted lymphoid cells. Um, and some of these are in areas that are. are um, certain aggregates of these, known as pyrus patches, uh, that are associated with the small intestines, and then also you have those primary and secondary lymphoid organs. Primary lymphoid organs are areas where your T cells and your B cells are going to mature. Uh, both the B and T, uh, T cells will originate in the bone marrow, but only the B cells will mature there. The T cells are going to move and mature in the thymus. Your secondary lymphoid organs um, are going to be areas where your mature lymphocytes 
first encounter that antigen and become activated. Because like I said, they have to be activated first. So these would include things such as the lymph nodes, the spleen, uh, some of that diffuse lymphoid tissue, and also what we call malt, mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue. And so over here on the left-hand side, you can see the primary lymphoid organs, the thymus, and then the red bone marrow. And then the secondary lymphoid uh, organs would be your lymph nodes, your tonsils, your spleen, your appendix. And then like I said, those pyro patches, these are these nodules that are areas on the small intestines. The lymph nodes. This is the primary secondary uh, lymphoid organ is the secondary one, but it's the, the main one that you're going to see. You have hundreds of nodes throughout the body. Uh, most of them are embedded deep in connective tissue. They're associated along with the lymphatic vessels because they will drain into the lymph node. Some of them are closer to the surface uh, where you tend to have clusters. There's three main areas of clusters superficially. Uh, which makes it easier for you to see or to feel or palpitate. It palpitates when you feel them. And this would be the inguinal area, the axillary and cervical area regions of the body. The lecting ducts are congregating. And so once again, in the inguinal area, you have this uh, collection of them. You have collection in the axillary region and then also in the cervical region. Have you ever wondered why when you went to the doctor, they're often uh, feeling along your neck, what they're looking for or feeling for, they're palpitating, is the cervical nodes to see if they are swollen. If they are swollen, that's indicative of an infection or potential infection. That's, that's what they're doing. Um, do they feel soft? Do they feel very hard? The main functions of the lymph nodes, they are filters. So they're going to filter that lymph as it passes through. There are macrophages that um, live in the, the lymph nodes, and so they are going to be on surveillance, monitoring any foreign substance that goes through. And if it passes through, it's going to attack and destroy it. Another function of the lymph nodes is because this is where some of the uh, lymphocytes are basically stored, that's where they are, they become activated. Like, so you have to activate them in order for them to be effective. And so as a foreign substance comes through, uh, there's a whole process with the immune system. We'll talk about how um, the lymphocytes become activated and then start the whole attack. So the lymph nodes can vary in shape and size. Most of them are kind of bean shaped. They're only about an inch um, in size. There is a capsule that is going to surround it, and uh, the fibers are going to extend inward, dividing it in that lymph node into compartments. You have the cortex and the medulla area. Uh, the cortex, by now, whenever you see those terms, you should be familiar that cortex is typically going to be superficial, and the medulla is going to be more interior. So the cortex superficial area uh, contains follicles, uh, you usually have a lot of B cells in this area. As you move, move deeper into the node, the deep cortex houses T cells. Uh, these T cells are often moving along with the blood, so they're very transient. Remember, they're constantly moving. You also tend to have a high amount of dendritic cells associated with both those B and T cells. The dendritic cells are going to play a role in activating the T and B. The medulla, you have medullary cords, as I said, that are going to divide the node into compartments. Um, it will contain B cells, T cells, and plasma cells. The lymph sinuses are found throughout the node. The, um, you tend to have these reticular fibers, and the macrophages are hanging out there. So, notes here you have the afferent lymphatic vessels that's bringing fluid in. You have multiple ones bringing in. You can see the capsule and then the trabeculi. That's these fibers that are forming these different little compartments within here. And then you have 
for the dua, which is the innermost area. So the lymph is flowing in, and one thing to notice is that you have, number one, more vessels bringing fluid in than what you have vessels leaving. The efferent the lymphatic vessels are bringing the fluid out. It's what's draining out of the lymph node. So if you have more flowing in than what's flowing out, that means um, it's going to slow up the flow in here, which is a good thing because if it slows down the rate that the, the lymph is moving, then that means you're spending more time in here. Think about it. If you're going into a store and you've got a crowd of people and there's five entrances coming in, but there's only two to go through a turnstile, you get backed up here. That is good in this standpoint because it allows more time, more possibility that if there is a foreign substance, that those macrophages are going to see it. They're going to find it. They're on surveillance, remember. And so it increases the chances of a better filtration. Ideally, what leaves the lymph as it leaves through the efferent lymphatic vessel you don't want to have any pathogens on there. You don't want any foreign substances on it. You want to stop it here, ideally. So slow it down to increase the probability that um, you have a more efficient flow. And this is just a photomicrograph, also of a lymph node. As you can see, the capsule, you can see the uh, medulla area here, the sinuses where the lymph is going to be flowing through. So as I just mentioned in that diagram, it's going to uh, flow into by the afferent lymphatic vessel. It helps you to remember, oh gosh, which is which, afferent or efferent, which is coming in, which is leaving. Think of it alphabetically. A comes first. That's arriving. Efferent, it's exiting. So it's going to, uh, the lymph travels in through the afferent lymphatic vessels. It's going to travel through the sinuses. First the subcapsular, then the medullary sinuses, and finally it will leave through the efferent. And once again, here is a picture showing. Bubos, this is the term that we use for an inflamed lymph node. They're usually swollen. Um, and as I said, that's often a sign of an infection because the lymph node's being overwhelmed. They're trying to destroy whatever that foreign substance is. Sometimes they may actually become uh, filled with pus. They get their names, uh, or this term is used, meaning the swollen gland. Bubonic plague, one of the symptoms are these swollen lip nodes or these bubos. That's how it gets its name. Lymph nodes can become a secondary site for cancer because if the cancer cells, some of them have, cancer has metastasized. Some of the cancer cells have broken off from the primary tumor and they are traveling through the lymph. If they become trapped in the lymph node and start dividing there, that can be a secondary cancer site. Um, and so usually if that happens, it's not painful. And so that's how you can determine, or at least be a clue to help you. Is it cancer or is it an infection? The spleen is another one of your lymphoid organs. It has a very good, rich blood supply. It's located uh, just kind of beside and uh, below the stomach. It is served by the splenic artery and vein. Its function is that that is where you have some of the lymphocyte proliferation. It's involved with the immune response. It also helps to clean the blood of old blood cells to, and platelets tend to uh, accumulate here. Macrophages are going to remove that debris. So here you can see the spleen tucked right over here on the left side of the, the stomach. This cross section of the spleen showing that you do have this rich blood supply to the spleen. 
clean up, uh, like I say, the, the debris out of the blood. And this is an actual photograph showing it uh, right in here. This then layer right up here. This is your diaphragm. Here's the adrenal gland, which is located on top of the kidney. So here's the kidney, left kidney right here. Here's the pancreas, and normally the stomach would be placed right here. They have removed the stomach to take this picture. The spleen is also going to help break down uh, products of those uh, old red blood cells. One of the things that it will store some of these byproducts or components, things such as iron that binds to the hemoglobin, when it breaks down the red blood cells, it breaks down hemoglobin proteins, and the iron it will store here for later use. It tends to store blood platelets here. It will store monocytes uh, that can be released in the blood. So it's kind of like a, an excess storage place. When you need it, then it will release it. Um, it feels it's not quite sure, but we think that it's also an area for uh, production of erythrocytes in a developing fetus. Histology speaking, there's two components, the white pulp and the red pulp. The white pulp is where most of the immune function is going to occur. It is composed of mostly lymphocytes. Uh, it tends to be around the central arteries. The red pulp is where the old uh, red blood cells are and where bloodborne pathogens are going to be destroyed. So it's very rich in red blood cells. Macrophages are going to engulf them. So here, once again, you see uh, a cross-section of this and an actual photograph of it where you can see the white pulp versus the red pulp area. Another clinical manifestation or example is where the spleen has this very thin capsules. It's not very thick. So if you receive a direct blow, um, it may rupture. If you have a severe infection of it, it may rupture. And what's going to happen? All that blood is going to spill into the peritoneal cavity. Surgical removal of that rupture in spleen is called a splenectomy. Um, they used to do this fairly often if there was a ruptured spleen to prevent hemorrhaging, to prevent shock because of that excessive loss of blood. And you can survive without the spleen. Your immune system is not going to be working quite as effectively. Uh, but they have found that uh, the spleen can actually repair itself. So as long as you don't have excessive blood loss and there's not a danger of going into shock from that blood loss, um, there's more information saying that maybe it would be best to just leave the spleen in and let it repair itself. So the number of splenectomies has uh, decreased dramatically. <coughs> if you do have to remove that spleen, then the liver and the bone marrow will take over the functions. In young children uh, who were used to have very active growth hormone, etc., the spleen can regenerate if you leave part of it, a uh, small portion of it. The malt or the mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. This is found uh, in mucous membranes throughout the body. It helps to protect uh, from pathogens trying to enter into the body. So you find them in the respiratory tract, genital urinary organs, and digestive tract. The largest collection are found in the tonsils, the pyrus patches, and the appendix. Your tonsils. Um, are found now around or near the pharynx. Uh, they you have multiple tonsils and they're named according to their location. The palatine tonsils, uh, these are the largest of the tonsils. These are the ones that most often become infected. They're at the posterior end of the oral cavity. The lingual tonsils are at the base of the tongue. The pharyngeal tonsils, these are also known as the adenoids. These are located in the posterior wall of the uh, nasal pharynx. Sometimes these do become infected frequently enough that they may also be removed. Tubal tonsils are around the openings of your uh, auditory tubes into the pharynx. So 
the function of the tonsils is to, to gather and remove pathogens that are coming in through food or air. Um, so there are follicles that um, have scattered lymphocytes associated with them. Uh, bacteria will enter into them or they become trapped and they get destroyed. So in this drawing right here, you can see how the in these crypts, the organisms can become trapped in here. And this is shown here, so uh, pharyngeal tonsils, palatine tonsils, lingual tonsils. Pyrus pepsis are uh, associated with the wall of the small intestines. They're going to help destroy bacteria, prevent them from uh, breaching that intestinal wall. Uh, you oftentimes have uh, contamination of bacteria, viruses, etc., in items that you've ingested. And as it's going through the digestive system, in the small intestines is where you have most of the absorption occurring. You do not want foreign substances to become absorbed and once they get in the body be able to spread through through the blood because remember the intestines has a rich blood supply and then it's going to go to the liver for filtration. If you can prevent say a bacteria from ever even entering into the body uh, via the digestive system you don't want it to. So you okay you ingested it it's in say the food that you ate you don't want it to be absorbed and move across that intestinal wall. So the pyre patches are going to help prevent that. The appendix is a little uh, appendage off of uh, the large intestines, right shortly after the large intestines is connected to the small intestines. has a lot of lymphoid follicles, kind of similar functioning as the pyrus patches, and that it can destroy bacteria. <clears throat> now, Usually, ideally, the pyrus patches are going to remove anything, and so there would be nothing left, hopefully, by the time it reaches the appendix. It's often referred to as a vestigial um, structure, meaning that it's a leftover thing. It doesn't function as much as it used to, and I'm talking about thousands of years ago. This appendix, oftentimes, as you can hear, this little offshoot here, often becomes inflamed. If it becomes inflamed and swollen, uh, that's when you have appendicitis. That needs to be treated. You do not want to have it uh, progress to the point where the appendix ruptures. If it ruptures, it is going to then leak all that material into this, the entire abdominal pelvic cavity, and that's going to be much harder to treat and clean up. Um, I have found over the years, especially when we used to work with cadavers uh, years ago at another college, is that students were usually amazed at how small the appendix is. And I could always tell who had had appendicitis because they were the ones that would say, that little tiny thing caused me so much pain. Yes, if it becomes inflamed, it is very painful. And like I say a ruptured appendix can be fatal if left untreated. The thymus is another one of your lymphoid uh, organs. Uh, it's found um, in the neck. It does extend into the mediastinum, kind of overlies the heart. This is where the T cells are going to mature. Uh, we mentioned this from studying the endocrine system. Uh, the thymus is largest and most active in childhood, and then it stops growing during adolescence and will gradually atrophy, and so it is much smaller as you, as you are an adult as compared to when you are a child. It does still produce those T cells, but much slower rate. The thymus is broken into lobules. Um, and as I said, you have very rapidly dividing lymphocytes and you have macrophages that are scattered throughout in there, in the cortex area. And then the medulla area, there's going to be fewer lymphocytes. Um, and like I said, this is where the, the T cells are going to mature. And there's, there's different classifications or types of T cells. 
and the regulatory T cells are going to develop here. Regulatory T cells help to control, as the name implies, helps to regulate the immune system. So they play a role with uh, trying to prevent autoimmune diseases. Now, the thymus does not have any B cells. It does not directly fight antigens. It's just helping to uh, provide a place where the T cells are going to mature. And this is it. As you can see up here, it's a thymus and a cross-section and a histology slide of it.